especially. And it's one of those like old cliche adages like time is money. And um, so I've tried to cut down the number of images that I'm shooting, which is hard. Welcome to Workflows, presented by Imagine AI. Workflows is a podcast about saving you time and money in your photography business. Hear from people just like you. Put down that camera for a little, connect the headphones, and get to work with Workflows. Today in episode two of Workflows, I am chatting with New Jersey wedding photographer Mike Zawatsky. Mike is one of the leading wedding photographers in the world. He has a distinctive style that helps his couples remember their wedding day memories in a timeless, bold, and genuine way. Mike has been photographing weddings for over a decade and enjoys a technically challenging low light situation as much as he does a stunning once in a lifetime sunset and sky. He typically starts with traditional poses that makes older members of families smile. Then, based on the rapport he builds with the clients, he mixes in more personalized and creative shots of couples based on their preferences and vibe. Mike enjoys meeting new couples and learning about their unique love stories, which helps his subjects feel comfortable in front of his camera, no matter how shy or introverted they may feel. In a society where we are bombarded with negative self-image content on social media with algorithms that help create false narratives about how we should look, Mike's philosophy in photography and life is to reject this status quo. He firmly believes Everyone deserves to have a beautiful photograph of them, no matter what their age, size, race, gender, religion, or sexual orientation may be. When not photographing weddings, Mike can be found seeking out the best hidden gems of New Jersey pizzerias and spending quality time cooking delicious, impromptu meals with his girlfriend, Melanie. We're going to dive right in to my conversation with Mike Zawatsky. Let's go. Hi, Mike. Hey, how's it going? (laughs) Good. Uh, I'm going to act like we haven't talked in the past hour, but we, we just got finished wrapping up a live stream for the Imagine AI community. So we really have been talking for an hour. <laughs> yeah, long time no see. My first question for you is, uh, is, is, what is one thing that you do for the photographic process that has saved you time? So are you asking, like, not including AI type stuff? It could be AI, but not uh, not specific to Imagine AI. Okay, so uh, in terms of photographic process, I mean, this year I've learned a lot of things in terms of, uh, especially, and it's one of those like old cliche adages, like time is money. And mm-hmm. um, so I've tried to cut down the number of images that I'm shooting, which is hard because I also just switched about uh, a year and a half ago to Sony mirrorless cameras and they take pictures really fast. They focus really accurately. Like in the live stream, we were just talking about um, how the 51.2, like you can nail images at 1.2. So it's hard to not go a little bit crazy. And, you know, this switch to Sony mirrorless has really reinvigorated my like passion for certain types of motion shots and taking more risks because they're not really risks anymore or shooting like a crazy 30 frame a second burst on a walking or running picture. So I've really had to try to, and I've, and I'm, you know, some of my other photographers that work for me have done the same. They've switched to mirrorless and, and I know, um, and even some of the Facebook groups I'm in, other photographers have been saying like, it's really hard to not overshoot right now because the cameras are so good, but I've really tried to do that on the, um, I guess, the front end, the photography side of my job is to, okay, these tools we have now are great, but let's try to um, be still be efficient with them and not overdo it. And, um, you know, I don't, I'm trying not to be hard on myself or anybody that's worked for me or anybody else out there. I mean, it's just something that kind of happened to everybody naturally. Uh, So that was my first uh, sign to me that, okay, I can shoot a little bit less and that does help, but I also needed help with the volume I was taking on and that I am taking on still with my jobs. I need to be able to call down the images more efficiently. I need to be able to edit Mm. the images more efficiently. So this whole year has been about efficiency in terms of my job, but then also kind of like we talked about on the live stream, also work-life balance, being able to have the time to do those things. So 
yeah, that's uh, it's kind of all ties together into the theme of this year was time is money, but also time is valuable, personal time. In fact, there's an um, uh, old friend of mine who I've worked with uh, over the years. He works now for Tave and, and Shoot Proof. Um, his name's Dave Shea, and, and he also does, like, um, one-on-one, uh, like, you know, because a big thing for him is he kind of went through the same thing um, years ago himself. Like, he was working himself to the bone, and he's like, how do I spend time with my wife and my kid and still have a happy life? So I've really, even though this has been the busiest year and a lot of people have kind of punted um that kind of aspect of their life like all right i'm just gonna like work like crazy this year and i'll figure out the rest in the future but um with you know some of the things that um, i've gone through and and my girlfriend's gone through um, medically and you know we're very grateful uh, for her health and everything now but you know some things happen in life where you do realize like um yes my job is important but there are things more important believe it or not than a job and uh, being able to manage your time and um, balance is, is really important. So that's really uh, the overall theme for this year for me. That's great. Yeah, you know, um, historically, I've always used a DSLR and had my DSLR set to um, uh, continuous high. <laughs> like I would hold down the shutter and it would go click, 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 click. And I was using Nikon D8, D800, D850, so that it, they were fast. Um, now, now that I use Nikon Z bodies, which are their mirrorless, uh, I had to switch it to, to single because it really is, it, they're faster and, uh, and easier to get out of control. And, uh, I agree with you, like being able to find ways like that to spend more time with the family, uh, away from the, away from the office, away from the computer. It's so valuable in many, yeah. many, many ways. Yeah. And I have to say, even when I was with the D850, like the D850 was my favorite DSLR before I switched to mirrorless. I even started to develop the methodology and, and style and approach that I use now with when I had the D850. That's when I really did start to feel comfortable shooting wide open at like 1.4 with like the Nikon, the, the 105, 1.4, which is even though I, I love Sony and, um, and if any of my Sony peeps out there listening, um, I'm fully team Sony, but that is one lens I miss. And hopefully Sony comes out with something. And I think they might be similar to the 105, 1.4. I mean, the 85 and the 135 GM lenses I have are great, but um, just a little side note. But yeah, I, I started that uh, approach philosophy, doing things in the spirit of that with the D850 myself a couple of years ago, because it, it probably was the best focusing uh, DSLR I had. And that's kind of just... Um, evolved over the past two years into you know now i shoot with the sony a1s and um you know i originally i had the sony a92 it was the best focusing camera i ever had i didn't think that is fast camera yeah that is a very fast camera and i didn't think that there was ever something that would be faster but the a1 is even faster and it's hard been hard for me to imagine so and also too i've really with the a1 being a 50 megapixel versus the 24 on the a92 i've really um really tried to uh be more careful about going into that burst and and really how many photos i'm taking and also too slowing down a little bit like that has helped me be more careful with things like composition and um, looking for distracting things in the background so it's been good to to slow down a little bit especially over the past few months with um, my approach you you've got a a a bunch of photographers that work for you uh, in your in your wedding photography business. Yeah. Do you have them all using the same cameras, uh, or are they still mixed up? Well, how's that scenario? Uh, that's a good question. Hey, if everybody could shoot with the A one, I would, and if I could afford to buy everybody that works for me an A one, I would. It would be fantastic, or even some kind of Sony camera. I mean, you know, uh, my. My primary um, photographer, who's like my right hand, her name's Tiffany. Um, she recently, uh, earlier this year, it's hard to remember, it's all kind of blurred together, but she switched to Sony uh, as well. I have another photographer uh, working for me who is in the middle of doing that himself. Actually, a few. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of us have switched to Sony, but some uh, still shoot with like Nikon mirrorless or Canon mirrorless. And, um, it's actually, it's fine because I don't particularly care what someone's using. Uh, I think for this upcoming year, I am going to make it a requirement 
for my team to use mirrorless cameras and not DSLRs, which might sound crazy, but there is just such a significant difference between, and, I'm, and again, I love Sony. I'm Again, I'm team Sony, but hey, everybody's making good cameras and lenses right now. There's no doubt about it. So I'm, I'm not going to penalize someone working for me and be like, oh, you can't work for me because you're not using the brand I use. But um, I would like them to start using mirrorless only this year because no matter what brand it is, there is a significant difference in the sharpness yeah. um, and the focusability of the cameras. Uh, but there, yeah, you know, see, I was thinking, I was thinking more just the color science aspect of it, the, so that yeah. when you get the when you get the photos from each of the photographers, you know those colors are going to be as accurate to each other as they possibly can versus Canons, which are going to be very different than Sony's, or Nikon's, which are going to be very different than Sony's, well, and so on. Let me but, let me just stop you there yeah. for a second. I've noticed actually the Nikon. I have no problem um, batching or imagine AIing or whatever you want to call it, the, <laughs> those files together. Right. Um, but the Canon, and this is not to say anything bad about Canon, but it's just that the, um, if, like for example, if I took a Canon file from scratch and edited it, I'm sure it would look great. But when I use the particular profile and preset that I have set up for my cameras and put it on a new, especially with the older, it's funny because with the older Canon, like 5D Mark IV, no problem, works great, but um, and maybe a couple minor adjustments. But with the newer CR3 files from like the EOS R, R6, R5, it looks like crap when I put my preset on it. Again, I'm not saying the Canon RAW file is crap, it's just that the camera calibration and the exact color adjustments I've made to it look uh, not good. So I'm, I'm working on uh, one of the things I'm going to be working on this off season is um, you know, trying to. Uh, evangelize for Sony a bit more and get my team to switch. But um, no, it, it, but uh, that was just a joke. But in reality, I'm going to be working on a separate um, preset for, and I, and I do have them, but they're still just not quite there. I have like, you know, I have all my like funny preset names, like MZ, Homebrew, Neutral, 2.0. I'm, I have made a Canon version of that, but it's not quite there. So I would really like to do that. And I would... Um, you know, it's one of the things I'm considering doing with Imagine AI is making a separate profile for the Canon files because, again, for Nikon, Nikon um, NEFs and Sony RAW files, no problem. I think um, they're very similar in terms of their colors, even if they're not exact. They're similar enough for me so that when I apply my presets and adjustments that I typically do, I don't really need to worry about it. But the Canon ones are so drastically different in the way that um, Lightroom interprets the colors from the raw files that I am considering making a separate uh, Imagine AI profile for them, or at the very least, um, uploading into Fine Tune a bunch of Canon images edited with the new preset. So I have to think about that and yeah. maybe talk to you guys a little bit about that too. Sure, sure, sure. Cool. Um, what is one thing that you do for the business that saves you time or money? Again, not Imagine AI related, but overall for their business. Sure. So um, here's a great example. It came to my mind right away. After I've booked couples and, you know, over the next two years, we have hundreds of weddings on the books. And I don't say that to brag. I mean, I am proud of it. But I say that because that's also hundreds of people with questions that could be um, the most popular one is. And I'm even getting it for 2023 or late 2022. Oh, um, you know, my makeup artist wants to know what time you're coming. Well, you know, my knee jerk reaction to that, which I would never say to somebody because they're my clients and I like them and I know that they're just trying to plan their way. My knee jerk reaction is you're getting married like next year, like over a year from now. Like you don't think I have anything else to think about between now and then. But of course, that wouldn't be very nice for me to say. And I actually don't mean that. But instead of having that kind of um, response or being like, oh, we'll worry about it later. I was like, how can I solve this problem? So I had my copywriter write an article for me on my website called What Time Should My Photographer Arrive at My Wedding? And it lays out um, several different scenarios like 
Um, everything on location with a first look. Um, two or three locations with no first look. Um, and one more, I, I forget off the top of my head, like four locations because there's like a park or something in addition to a, a separate ceremony and reception and getting ready site. So it lays out uh, for the reader a few different scenarios, the suggested amount of time that each part of the day requires for photography and helps give, helps the client kind of make that decision themselves because um, as much as I love helping with weddings and stuff, I simply uh, was just spending too much time with these emails and back and forth. So that's been a big time saver is to have information. And of course, I don't just dump the links on people. I'm like, hey, um, as you can imagine, this is not the only time I've gotten this question. Here's a really helpful article I wrote um, right. about this. And I think this will help you. But if you have more questions specific to your wedding, I'd be more than happy to jump on a call, which segues into something else that's really just been a, uh, a game changer for me. And that's the app or software called Calendly. And mm. um, I was just, I'm like, if you, if again, go and just rewind a little bit. So I tell them, if this isn't answering your question, by all means, let's jump on a call. Here's a link to schedule a call with me. And that has been so powerful for me to be able to just send someone a link. And, and I and I try and do it always in a polite way, like, hey, I'd love to talk to you, set up a call with me here. You know, in terms of sales psychology, and I'm actually about to do um, another interview with uh, uh, my, I call him, I mean, he is a mentor and someone I've hired in the past, but he's a friend now. His name's Sam uh, Jacobson, and he runs a company called ID Action Consulting. I've learned a lot of tips from him about efficiency and um, all sorts of things. But, he, you know, one of his strategies has always been end your emails with a question because you're more likely to get a response, less likely to be, uh, quote unquote, ghosted by somebody. So that was great. I always used to love to ask the question. You know, I present I'm available Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday evenings. When's good for you? When is good for you is a very powerful tool if you are trying to get responses and, and keep conversations going with people. But I've gotten to the point in my career now, and I, and I know Sam would agree, I'll, I'll ask him later today when I speak with him, but you, know, you get to a point where you don't need to be quite as um, you know in, into the back and forth like that. And I was just doing so many emails about when's good for you, when's good for you, when's good for you. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And people have been telling me for actually a couple of years to try out Calendly or Acuity or some kind of scheduling software that integrates with Google Calendar. And I, um, you know, over the past three years or so, I've basically been keeping my entire life on Google Calendar anyway, just to, you know, keep myself, um, you know, by nature, I'm a intense person, a creative person, a, a curious person, but I've not always been the most organized person. So you know, in order to keep my life together and not, you know, with the wheels constantly falling off, I started just putting everything on Google Calendar, doctor's appointments, um, dates, haircuts, um, personal time, um, someone's birthday party, things like that. So I was already in the good habit of that for a few years now. So jumping into a software like Calendly that integrates a scheduling software with something I'm already using like Google Calendar was a no brainer. It makes me feel a little bit more professional to have a scheduler instead of just a back and forth type thing. I think the clients like being able to um, see uh, their, you know, my availability without having to do more back and forth with me. And it also, you know, it gives them the ability to set reminders via text if they want or via email. You know, I, I can set up on the back end. You can't text bomb people with it, thankfully, because that would be super annoying if you signed up for something and didn't want text reminders. But it, there's an option for the, the end user, the client to use it. But for me, I can pick email reminders. I can also limit the amount of things I'll do in a day. So, for example... Because I just did the live stream with you, I had a client, a quick client call this morning, and I'm doing this podcast now. I only have one other call today. I'm taking it six six thirty, which honestly might even be a bit too much because I have other stuff to do in between. But you can limit the amount of events of a certain type that you take within a day. You can limit the space. Uh, or increase the space between them. So I'm yeah. not doing like a three o'clock call and a three thirty call. Like I'm putting an hour and a half buffer between calls because I have to yeah. have 
have clothes in the laundry in the in the dryer right now. I have to go get. So you have to you have to be able to uh, to and, you know. It was one of those things where it's like, oh well, I don't want to use an automated scheduler because what if someone schedules something when I have to, you know, um, take my dog for a walk or I want to do my laundry or make something to eat? But the great part about is the customization ability within Calendly, and I'm assuming other scheduling softwares too, mm-hmm. to be able to kind of buffer out your appointments and um, have time to walk the dog and, and do your laundry, uh, things like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I use a I use a similar tool for myself. Uh, it's a different one, but basically it works the same exact way as as Calendly, and it's um, they're definitely great for you know uh, booking your clients, booking a, a, a podcast guest, yep. <laughs> so many different things. Um, sure. And and also going back to the blog post too, uh, that is so good in so many ways. Not only is it giving you the ability to have a pre-made reply, right? You're also sending buddy, sending a potential client or a client back to your website, but also that blog post is going to start getting indexed by Google, and that's just going to help your site Correct. To come up more. Um, uh, and I, I just I looked at the at the URL and the, and the title, and, and you definitely it's optimized for New Jersey weddings. So. <laughs> It's it's a um, it's it's a it's a very good idea on multiple fronts. So great job utilizing the blog for uh, multiple business aspects. Really, thanks. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no doubt about it. I'm not uh, pulling any punches there. I'm definitely uh, key, <laughs> keywording that title to hit where it needs to. And um, yeah. also to yeah, the, in addition to everything you just said, which is a great point about it being good for SEO and other, you know, it's also good for like social proof. It's like, hey, like this guy knows what he's talking about. Like, you know, he's prepared. Um, I have actually like 13 more of those posts that I have pre-written um, by my copywriting team. Uh, also from ID Action Consulting, they do a really good job. Um, but yeah, they. Uh, I just haven't had time, unfortunately. You know. One of my biggest goals this off season is to get a bunch of more of that content up again for better mm-hmm. social proof for SEO and just to be more helpful to my clients. Um, but right now we do have articles on there. Another example is, you know, five ways or three ways I forget the number how to uh, on how to prepare for your engagement session, on how to. Um, you know, how to feel comfortable in front of the camera, um, six, th- you know, even before people book, like one of the things I do is once I see the Calendly um, notification come up in my email, it's like, oh, um, you know, Ashley has created an appointment with you. I send a little canned response on Gmail. It's like, hey, thanks for setting up the appointment. I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Here are two articles you might want to read before the call. Like, Six things to ask your New Jersey wedding photographer before meeting them. Uh, how to prepare for your first call with your photographer, like things like that. It really does, um, you know. I have no doubt about it that that adds to my credibility and my um, clients and potential clients' comfort and knowledge. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. It's a very, it's a very smart way to utilize the blog, uh, and I look forward to seeing all the rest of these uh, these these pieces come out there. So what is one thing that you do for editing <laughs> that has saved you time? Uh, yeah, obviously, Imagine AI has, has helped me a bunch. I mean, I'll give a little backstory here. So again, everything I talked about before, I, I realized, obviously, I need a little bit of help. I need a hand. Uh, outsourcing editing is nothing new in the photography industry. It's very common. Um, there are a lot of... Uh, photographers who are uncomfortable with it with good reason like I said in the live stream earlier too because you that is your names on it it's what people are going to see it's the representation of you in the visual form it's it's how you sell it's you know trust me there's a lot more that goes in the sales than just having pretty pictures and um, you know there's photographers out there and uh, you know I'm not bashing or anything they just aren't great photographers but are great sellers and, and book a lot of work personally I could just I love the art of it too much. I couldn't do that, but it is possible to um, book a lot with um, not putting too much into the artistic side, unfortunately, but a little bit of a tangent. But I I like to do both. I like to be good at sales and I like to be delivering a great product. I enjoy the art of it. If I didn't, I would do something else. You know, I would, uh, I just, I like the art side of it. But so I realized I needed help. 
Um, I have, uh, again, I mentioned Tiffany before. She's also, you know, an incredible Photoshop um, operator and, you know, she's really good at Lightroom too. And you know, we've sat down together and she's gone over my style and she has all my presets and we, you know, we talked about it hours, like hours and hours over the past couple of years. So yeah, I trust Tiffany to do my editing and um, I think I'll be sending her some work uh, here and there. Uh, still, but you know, especially when something is going to require more of the uh, hand, uh, either retouching or su subject or sky selecting type stuff, um, I'm still going to be sending her some work. But because of how important she is to my company in terms of being a photographer, I could not realistically expect her to. She has three kids, she has a household, she has just as many weddings as I did this year, over 60. She does engagement sessions for the couples that she's going to be the lead shooter for in the future. How can I expect her to do almost as much as I am? And I don't have kids, but I mean, I have a dog. It's not the same. But how am I going to expect her to do that and also edit? So I was, especially as the year got busier, I wasn't able to give her as much. And, you know, um, it was... Uh, I just needed another solution. So I started using an editing company. Um, they've done a good job overall. If I'm going to be paying that kind of money for editing, I might as well be like a, a hand editor. And also too, like I mentioned on a live stream, there's some logistics issues that come up when you work with a bigger editing company. And again, there's nothing bad to say about them. They've been overall fantastic, but sometimes um, it's hard to know if you're getting the same people working on it. There's also like scheduling, again, understandably on their end, like if they need to know when I'm going to be sending images in otherwise um you know it's it's uh especially the good companies are going to have a lot of people with demand so it's, it's tough and it's like what if i get sick or if i have something else an emergency that comes up and i can't meet that deadline so it's like i really need a better solution for this and originally i found after shoot the other software for ai for calling and I was using that and, and saving a ton of time and then i think i saw an instagram or a facebook or some kind of advertisement for AI editing and I looked at it and it was another company I don't even remember the name um and I looked at it and it's like oh this is cool but I can only use their profiles and I'm very particular about my editing style and eventually I saw another ad uh, and actually you know what the first company I forget it was like it's through a magazine or you know one of my um you know peers or friends in the industry sent me she's like oh I saw you're using um my friend Amy was like you're using Aftershoot um and you see this like other software for editing and I was like, no. And, and then she sent it to me and I checked it out and I was like, oh, it's cool, but it's not doing what I want because it's only the pre-programmed profiles, which I'm sure are nice. But when you're, you know, I'm 14 years into this, I have a very um, specific style. So it's right. like I needed to uh, to up the um, I, I wanted to maintain rather that style. But yeah, so I'm saying is that I wanted AI. I love the idea of AI anything. Actually, whether it comes to, um, you know, helping me edit photos or helping me do anything, I'm really interested in technology. But for something as specific as my photography style, I really wanted to be able to have more input on it. And then I saw an ad for Imagine AI and I, I looked at the website and I read about it and I was a little confused at first. I'm like, how does it know? Do I upload like before and afters or, or what do I do? And then I, I did a little research on how it worked. And I gave it a try and I was like, wow, this is exactly what I wanted. It lets me um, set up a profile based on work I've already done. And then not only that, the, the, the real selling point for me was that it's able to learn from what I'm doing. Because like I mentioned on a live stream too, what I think looks good changes over time, right? Like if you're a photographer for as long as I've been for, for 14 or 15 years, you're not going to be editing the same way you were even maybe three or four years ago. So the ability to continuously give feedback to the um, profile and to the neural network that it runs on is great. So that's uh, that was uh, the selling point for me was the ability to start with your own profile and not a built-in one. And there are built-in ones for those who don't have enough images to start with, but the ability to start with your own and to fine tune it over time was just uh, was uh, 
really fantastic to me. Awesome. Awesome. So what was one thing that you do, uh, that you do after the sessions, after these weddings, after the engagement sessions that you do to increase business? Um, well, you know, I, I do share the images, uh, with the clients pretty quickly after, you know, within, you know, three or four days, um, sometimes the next day, if I, if I have the time, I'll you send, share all of them or, or sneak peeks. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Previews like, like, you know, previews. Okay. Uh, and a decent amount too. So, um, I actually, after we get off the call here for the podcast, I have a few proposals to write for future jobs and I have some previews to edit from, a wedding um, and from an engagement session. And that's helped because people get to enjoy it right away. They share it right away. Um, it builds like nice buzz, like uh, not just for the client, of course, it's mainly for them so they can enjoy it, but their friends and family get to see it. They share it on Instagram, they tag me and, and all that stuff. So it's just, that's helped a lot um, with being able to, you know, create again, some buzz and an interest in what I'm doing right away, like right after the job. Awesome. So can you share an outlined breakdown, very basic overview of your workflow from lead to delivery? Like oh, wow. you don't have to get into the, into the nitty gritty, but just a basic outline of, of how, how it typically goes down. I mean, basically people just give me the money. I push the button and then that's it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, that was, that was a good, you know, you don't, you don't have to be there. The camera does it for you. <laughs> yeah. And then and now with the software, it just does it for me. I just push the button. Right. Um, no, so a good question. That's a great question. I mean, I could really, uh, I'll try and keep it uh, briefer, but you know, I get probably three or four leads every day and, um, I send a, you know, the biggest question is like, Oh, can you send pricing? Well, if you do, if you do, I'll just tell this, you know, this is advice I got from Sam also, but it's pretty just good general advice. If you send just like a price sheet or, or the worst is if you send a PDF because PDFs aren't mobile friendly, um, you know, and I was making that mistake a few years ago too. Sure. You know I mean, you'll book some work if someone really just loves your style and thinks the price is good, you're going to book some, some work that way, but you might even book like a decent amount, but there are, uh, you know, many vendors that a wedding couple is reaching out to and you want to stand out. I want to have a chance to talk to them, find out what's important to them, um, you know, create a custom proposal for them. And again, that's why I said I have to write some proposals. So first thing I do is, hey, um, you know, either I'm available for your wedding date or we have one of our team photographers available for your wedding. Here's some more information about what it's like to work with us with like a, a, a landing page I've set up for that. And here's the intro pricing page. It's a unlinked URL on my site that has intro pricing and uh, also has, you know, again, more of the process laid out about, you know, the next thing we're going to do is jump on a call together. We're going to find out what's important to you, find out what you're concerned about. Do you want to do an engagement session? Do you want to do, do you want a photo album or do you just want digital files? Do you also want to add on video coverage? So there's a lot that goes into it. It's not just like, you know, and so when I send that email, uh, either if someone doesn't hear back from me, I assume maybe the intro prices were too high for them. That's fine. Uh, some people do write back very rarely like, oh, like, well, oh, I saw that already. Like you just send me your prices, like your packages. Um, and you know, no, I don't. I mean, I know that might seem like not the most customer, uh, service friendly thing to do. But I say, I, you know, the nicer way to say it is, um, I actually don't have any preset packages that I send out. I create custom proposals for everybody because everybody's a little bit different. Some people want more hours or less hours, or some of the things I just mentioned to you as add on. Some people aren't sure about those things yet. So, you know, it's such, you're really missing out on an opportunity to do better in sales. If you're just sending out like, price sheets to people. Now, um, you know, I've seen this polled in different groups before. Some people say, oh, well, if I ask for pricing and I don't get like a full price sheet, like I'm not going to hire them. Well, you know, good for you. You're not, you're not my client then. I mean, thankfully, and, and I'm grateful to be able to be a little bit um, strict about something like that because I just, you know, that's not how I do business. I mean, there's plenty of photographers out there who are spamming people with PDFs and getting ghosted and stuff. And I'm just not a, uh, you know, not into that. There are, you know, different bot pe different types of people with preferences, like the more like spreadsheet oriented, like 
people who like to do that and want to compare prices and stuff. Again, it's not really my, typically my client. I'm missing out on a couple jobs here or there, I'm sure. But the overall net gain of sending out custom proposals and doing consultations with people over Zoom or on the phone has really um, improved my business versus, um, again, just sending out price sheets. So that the next step is setting up that consultation. Uh, use Calendly, like we talked about earlier, to either set up a Zoom or a phone call with them. After the um, the consultation, I'll write up a proposal for them that I'll send them. I try and send it when they get a chance to look at it. Like um, uh, I'm writing one right now after we get off this call for somebody who was away this weekend, even though we spoke on Friday, I didn't want to dump it in their inbox while they were away on a, on a trip with their fiance and have them buried. I actually te- I went out of my way to text her before. I was like, hey, I got a couple things to do, but I'm writing up your proposal now. I'll, I'll um, email it and text it to you in a little bit. Just again, to keep it, you know, a lot of this is sales psychology to keep it in the forefront of their mind to get the attention. So I send it, you know, generally within a, a, a day or day or a few days and um you know if it's a very uh logistically if it's a more complex lead that requires a little bit more attention to planning and locations i might ask them for example hey after uh you get a chance to look at the proposal let's set up another call to go over it or any questions you might have um you know i've don't do that so often, even though it is a recommended strategy as much as I used to. Again, just because of the volume I'm doing, I don't have the time to jump on a second call to try and sell to every single couple. But if the couple asks me, of course, I'm happy to jump on another call with them. That happens every now and then. Um, and then after they we you know finalize the coverage they want, I will send them a contract and a payment portal like all through my CRM, which is Tabe. And we'll book the uh, the job, and then you know plan the engagement session. Send them in more information about again some of that those other blog posts I was mentioning, like how to prepare for your engagement session, how to feel comfortable in front of the camera. Um, and you know there are points of contact. Uh, a lot of my clients feel very comfortable texting or emailing me, and and I don't mind. I know some people are like, oh, like I would never want clients texting me, but when I'm super swamped like this time of year finishing up edits, taking on new this, this, and that. I'd rather just have someone text me or use Calendly and like set up an appointment rather than email as one of the biggest time sucks for me as someone who's running a business that's high volume and busy. It's like I cannot sit there and go back and forth on email or keep checking my email. I've actually, when I was newer and really just trying to like grab as many jobs as I could and just really starting um, more from scratch, I would be like on my email, like a hawk answering it like instantly, but I've actually set up certain times of day as only times for email. It could be once in the morning, once in the evening. Unfortunately, sometimes when I'm really busy, it's just once in the evening when I get a chance to it because I don't want the distraction of the back and forth on email. Um, But I think I don't I don't know if um, if Windows machines have this capability, but on Macs. And on like iPhones, for example, and iPads, you can actually use screen time to prohibit like a Gmail app or a mail app from even being used between certain times. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it's cool stuff. Yeah, definitely. Um, I haven't thought about that on my Mac yet. I use on my phone like the focus, like do not disturb. Um, but no, that's an interesting idea for uh, I actually use a software as a plug in. Um, you can use on, I think on any computer, I have a Mac as well. It's called rescue time and it kind of tracks mm. what you're doing with, uh, your time. And like, if you're wasting time and I've noticed this year, my productivity score is like through the roof versus uh, previous years. But, um, yeah, so that after booking, setting up the engagement session, sending them previews for the engagement session, getting those edited, you know, um, if, if they reach out to me or I might send them an article I find funny or sometimes too, if it's honestly, I become pretty friendly with a lot of my clients. So I might just check in with them, see how they're doing. Um, but a few months before the wedding, two, three months before the wedding, I'll send out another timeline questionnaire for them to fill out, um, maybe with an article, maybe without and say, Hey, fill this out. Um, and then when you're done, you know, even if you don't know all the answers, do the best you can and, then let's here's a link to set up a follow-up call on that and we'll go over it so i can make a timeline for the wedding or um you know 
thankfully some uh, more of my weddings have been having planners lately well, the planner will make the timeline too uh, and then you know we photograph the wedding and uh, I send them the previews and then this is, is where the AI comes in is I after now see <clears throat> excuse me sorry after some people might run like after shoot to call the job immediately I like to do the previews first because again AI isn't perfect I know when I'm doing the previews, the job is still pretty fresh in my mind. I know the parts of the day where I'm going to be like, hey, I remember this thing happened. I definitely want to send them a preview of that. Right. And I try and space out the previews from getting ready through the dancing you know, reception. Um, so I'll do that. And then um, once it's up next in queue, I will run after shoot and then I'll clean up my after shoot call, you know, pretty quickly. And then I will uh, run it through after I go back in the Lightroom. I take the preview images that I've already sent them and I set those as like a separate star and color rating. And then I don't, I take those away. I hide them from my film strip and then I read the metadata from, uh, the um, from the after shoot call back into Lightroom and I tidy and then I um, set my parameters how I want for that so I have edited images marked as a certain color and then unedited images that I want edited um, as unrated basically five star with no color and I can run them through Imagine AI then and then I wait and I wait to get them back and I will just like we did on the live stream, I'll do like a, a quick once over through. And again, there's certain parts of the day just uh, that I can just scroll through without having to make any adjustments. Other parts of the day I might batch like some settings onto or I might just do. I'm very fast with Lightroom, so I might just copy and paste. Sorry. I might just copy and paste from image to image to and. Then I'll upload their gallery to Pixie Set. I'll send them a little thank you note in an email, share the gallery link. Uh, if they have ordered an album or have expressed interest in ordering albums, I'll explain that process to them, ask them if they want to jump on like a, a follow-up call to talk about how to pick out their album images. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much the brief as I what can do you, make it. What software do you use to, uh, to lay out your albums? Fundy. Fundy, nice. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of Fundy's. Yeah, it's just it's fantastic. I mean, yeah. there's some other good ones out there, but Fundy's just uh, very straightforward. It's like, you know, um, just the UI and, and the tools in it are very, uh, were always very intuitive to me. And I was able to mm -hmm. pick that up years ago and start using it without really having to, uh, to, you know, read too much about it or you know, watch YouTube videos about it or anything like that. It's just very straightforward from the start. And they they seem to be adding more and more features over time. And yeah, I'm a big fan of, a fan of their software. In fact, I, I, I could be wrong. So I might be biting my, by, you know, eating my own words here. But I think they were the first in the album design space many, many years ago. Um, obviously, now there's a lot more out there, but I think they were the first. Um, so, um, okay. So it's a, it's a, fantastic workflow from start to finish there's a lot there's a lot that goes on obviously uh, especially in the in the wedding business um, and it, you've got you know everything worked out in your own methods you've built over the past you said 14 years or so um, so it's a great workflow uh, I wonder now you've already started incorporating AI into your workflow yeah. um, already you've got AI in your camera Right, you've got AI for your calling. You've got AI for your editing. What does the future of AI and photography look like to you? I think, um, and actually, one of my friends, Antonio, who works for me uh, as a second shooter, he's also a writer for um, a website called The Verge, it's like a tech website. And mm -hmm. him and I have these conversations all the time. Like since we were going all the way, we, we met each other in like 2007 at, at college, and ever since then, you know, we've kind of been a little nerdy and stuff and I'm, I don't mind. I'm proud of it. I love the conversations <laughs> him and I have, Same here. <laughs> but yeah, we talk all the time about things like you just asked. And I think the next step for photography is going to be, um, having some of the features 
that are, and, and, and I've seen in certain comment sections and articles and stuff, which can be pretty toxic places. Anyways, there's been some resistance against this. They're like, oh, like I wouldn't buy a $6,000 camera if it was doing stuff that my iPhone does. I want my camera, it would be my camera. But I think the next step is some of the computational photography type things that um, iPhones, smartphones do, like, um, you know, uh, one thing I've heard complaints about, it's kind of become a problem, is I have a, a friend who's a photographer in Florida, and she actually had a client who was complaining, I think, un, unrightfully, and they were wrong, actually, but like, oh, uh, my you know, maid of honor was there, and she was taking pictures on her phone at the beach, and like her sky has more color in it, and the pictures on the phone were just darker. I, I mean, I saw them. But the point is... Um, that the computational photography algorithms in iPhones that can take several pictures quickly as a HDR and stack them and have it look natural, like uh, having detail in the sky on a backlit scenario, uh, like scene or, you know, foreground detail in a situation like that. It's just, uh, you know, I think uh, skin smoothing, um, uh, some of the AI things that we're seeing in Photoshop and Lightroom now, like subject selection, sky selection, uh, neural filters, uh, like you were talking about earlier with the colorizing um, old black and white photos, things like that. Yeah, I think the computational aspect of photography, it's going to be interesting to see if companies like Sony um, will start implementing more of that and wonder what the processing power might need to be for the cameras to be able to do things like that. But I think they'll have to um, because the iPhone, again, yes, it's limited by having a smaller sensor and, of course, lens selection. But honestly, for um, anything that's not a major event, like I'm bringing my iPhone. Like if I want to, I mean, I'm pro I, I, you know what, in general, I'll just use my iPhone for things out and about, but, um, cause the, the picture quality is very good, but I did bring my a one and a 135, 1.8 to the dog park the other day. So I'm still kind of that guy with the camera sometimes, but, um, <laughs> you know, I think computational photography and AI in cameras, um, is going to be one of the next steps. I mean, you, there's some things like you mentioned before, like face detection in cameras. Um, you know, from what I understand, some of the cameras actually uh, can learn. Like, for example, on my Sony cameras, I can take a picture of a couple uh, at the beginning of their wedding and program that into the camera to use those faces as the priority when. Nice. Yeah. I mean, that's so things like that. Making things like that more. I mean, most people that shoot Sony probably don't even know that, but it is a feature. Um <laughs> But the, making things like that mainstream and, you know, in order to keep justifying the cost for some of these cameras, they are going to have to be um, a bit more advanced in that nature or, yeah. you know, uh, any kind of exposure blending or stacking uh, as part of the future. On the editing side, I think, you know, um, everything we've talked about in terms of, of some of the standalone softwares like Imagine AI and Aftershoot, but also, you know, Adobe, I think what they implemented in the Lightroom lately with the uh, subject masking and sky right. masking was is great. It works fantastically. It's perfect, but I think it was long overdue. I mean, Lightroom had really suffered from that uh, for quite a while. I mean, I think still some of the retouching, like uh, I think the next big thing to be addressed in Lightroom is going to be uh, cloning and healing because it's just not very good right now. I mean, I, you know, we can all find ways. I think even during the live stream, I, I did clone out like a tree branch or something quickly yep, in my Lightroom. Did. But um, it's yeah, still... Yeah, it could definitely use some some content-aware yeah. features in Lightroom. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, uh, I think that's the future for... Yeah. You know, as you were talking about this, I'm thinking like, you know, so Aftershoot, for example, has the ability to detect, uh, as do all the other AI calling features or software is out there, but... They have the ability to detect when there's what they call duplicates, you know, images that are, you know, within seconds of each other that look very similar. There's no reason why cameras can't do that and automatically pick the best one of, of the, you know. Sure. It's just a matter of these, these companies building that software into a firmware update. Um, but that would be cool, a cool, cool use of AI in camera if that came to be, to save you from doing that afterwards. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I have one final question for you, and sure. um, you've touched on a lot of this during this conversation, but, uh, and you touched a lot on a lot of this actually in the live stream, which we're going to link to in the show notes as well, but 
uh, I'll, for, the, for anybody who's listening to the podcast right now, how has Imagine AI impacted your life? Not just your workflow, but impacted your life. Yeah, and uh, I think we've definitely talked about this a bunch between you and I and and across the Mm -hmm. different conversations we've had. But yeah, I mean, it's just um, being able to send something out and then do something at the same time is invaluable to me. I can send a job to be edited. I mean, sometimes I even wish I had two computers running it at the same time. I'm not sure that might mess it up or something. But um, yeah, I mean, just getting time back is like I said when we first started this conversation – um, time is so valuable. Being able to um, have that time back for, again, for work tasks or for, you know, I won't, don't feel guilty about um, spending time with my girlfriend or my family or my friends and knowing that the work's being done for me while I wait. And when I come back, I'll just spend like an hour or so just you know, click, click, click here and there, touch it up, make it look good. And then that, again, that I can send it back to have my profile be improved. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I'm really excited because what's what's crazy about this is, um, is that both Aftershoot, Imagine AI and, and some other uh, softwares out there have gotten so much attention recently and people have varying, um, you know, problems, complaints, praises, this and that. But the exciting part to me is that these companies are all really new. You know, like, I don't know exactly how long um, they've been around, but it's not been a long time. And now that we're really just in the very early stages of this. Yep. So I imagine over the next year, two years, five years, that the the level of sophistication in, um, you know, my profile that I'm working on now, what is it going to look like in a few years when it has like hundreds of thousands of images in it? I mean, yeah. Um, you know, what it's going to be able to do. I mean, we're, we're just really at the very basic stages of this and we're already seeing the um, return uh, in terms of time. And my biggest advice to anybody would be is that, yes, if it's not working perfectly for you, whether it's Aftershoot, Imagine AI, any AI, and perhaps you were hoping, and I don't say this is a criticism because it's, it's just, you know, a lot of people reached that point that I reached earlier this year when I was like, I need help. I need to do something to make this work better while also not, you know, spending so much money on culling and editing from an outside source that I'm not making money. So I said, you know, some people reach that point rather more recently during like, let's say late October, early November, when the pressure on them was already so high to get things done that unfortunately, I mean, I think if you started working on a profile, keep working on it, keep going, keep putting in the the time to fine tune it. But some people jumped into this uh, at a time when it would have been more beneficial for them to have started months ago and already had. And I'm I'm very grateful that I did. But if you are struggling with it right now, or you're thinking it's not working exactly how you want, don't give up because it's it's so much of this um, is based on your feedback to the neural network. Um, for your profile that you need to keep using it for in order for it to work and that in time it will keep improving again like during the I think it was during the live stream we used the the baby learning what a dog is learning a dog's name starting to call every single dog that original dog's name and then eventually learning uh, different types Uh, dogs have different names different owners this and that so yeah it's like teaching a baby those kind of things And, and you have to um you have to look at it that way, like from starting from scratch. No, I mean, even now with, with all the images that I've run through after shooting Imagine AI, I still have to make changes here and there, but I'm saving a ton of time because I'm not starting from scratch and I am, um, I know that I'm teaching the AI along the way, just like how I would teach an editor, just like I would teach, um, you know, uh, somebody to work on my pictures regardless. So that would be my biggest advice is this is not a one click solution. I wish it was, mm-hmm. but that would be, you know, it's, it's a tool to save you time and you have to stick with it. And then I think if people really stick with it over the slower months that, and really keep investing into fine tuning and, and working on their profile that um, next year it'll work even better for them. So for anybody that jumped in, when they started to feel how like I felt earlier this year, you know, if you're like, oh crap, I have like 15 weddings to edit, 10 family sessions, like uh, as many engagement sessions, like how am I going to do it all? I'm, I have empathy for you, but please understand that the AI software um, 
it doesn't work like right out of the box like how a human being would you need to train it and, and spend the time with it yeah and i mean the the goal is so that after a while of you teaching a profile and then sending fine tunes to further teach your profile the goal is that in the future a year from now two years from now you don't have to do anything afterwards <laughs> i hope <laughs> that it is smart enough that, that you don't have wonderful. to do anything that would yeah. be wonderful. I mean, the biggest thing too is like someone's like, oh, well, it's not doing my, um, even during the live stream, I mentioned like these like super like weird blue hour desk shots or night shots or um, for if it's not doing those consistently how you want, edit more of those photos, even if they're from older jobs and upload yeah. them to your fine tune. If you, yep. the way that AI works, as far as I understand, is through like intense repetition. It really, just like a baby, again, going back to that analogy or example, it needs to be told over and over uh, in order for it to learn. Yep, exactly, exactly. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for, for joining me on, uh, on, on our new podcast, Workflows. If you can share for all the listeners and the viewers um, the best place for everybody to learn more about you, see your wedding work, and whatnot. Sure, you can go to um, my website, mikesawatsky.com or on Instagram, Mike Zawatsky Photography. And I'm also very active in um, the Imagine AI and Aftershoot groups too, because I'm very interested in the technology and I want to I want to try and help people who are having problems with it and who it's not working how they hope for. And I want to help them set realistic, realistic expectations and get through the speed bumps. Thank you so much. You're we'll welcome. Talk soon. Thank you. Talk soon. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mike, for that awesome conversation about your photography workflows. And thank you, the listeners, for tuning in to this episode. You're invited to be part of the bigger conversation. Join the Imagine AI community today by going to imagineai.com slash community. And don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. You've been listening to Workflows presented by Imagine AI. To see the show notes and everything referenced in this episode, please go to imagine-ai.com slash podcast.